Minister of State for Infrastructure. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. And it's a pleasure to see you in that chair. It's an honor for me to rise to speak in response to the throne speech. And I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you live from the territories of Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil in my constituency of North Vancouver Lonsdale. I also want to start by thanking the people who supported me in arriving to the place that I am today with this great privilege of serving the people of British Columbia. I have been well supported over the past four years by wonderful constituency assistance at my community office, but I want to particularly thank Mac and Michelle. Through all of the last year, Mac and Michelle have been working from home, but working hard and tirelessly, nonetheless, serving the people of North Vancouver Lonsdale. They made sure that um, we were able to help disseminate information, answer questions, connect with community members, and ensure that people could access the help that was available to them through some of the most anxiety-ridden and stressful times of the lives of people in our community. I also want to thank the incredible people, my volunteers and my donors, who came out to support my re-election campaign in COVID safe ways. It was a very difficult and different campaign. Um, and without the hustle and, and bustle and social energy that normally accompanies an election campaign, I was concerned about our ability to, to get the word out. And I was concerned about our ability to attract uh, volunteers to our campaign, but we still found a way to do so and still found a way to communicate why reelecting a new Democrat government was so important for British Columbians at this critical time. And I have my volunteers and my donors to thank for that, as well as my amazing campaign team, led by the very brilliant, very dynamic and capable Stephanie Ryan, who returned to manage my campaign once more in 2020. I wouldn't be here without the steadfast support of all of the members of my local riding association executive as well, which is now led by Rhonda Spence. And I'm very grateful and fortunate to have her in that role. In keeping with the trend of having smart, hardworking women by my side, I'm also pleased to have Risha Sharma, Garveen Dhaliwal, and Nicole Hansen, who support me in my ministerial role out there in Victoria. Finally, I want to thank my amazing family, my mother, my father, my sister, and in particular, my brilliant partner, who has been with me and stuck with me despite my endless late nights working, days away from home, absent-mindedness for important dates like birthdays and anniversaries and general over-obsession with my work. <laughs> through, through all of it, he's cared for me, kept me fed, kept me loved and safe in ways that I will never be able to repay. And I'm really grateful to him. The throne speech spoke of a strong and resilient British Columbia. And I think we all owe that to our people, British Columbians, of whom I know every single member in this house is deeply proud. I can say that I'm particularly proud of the resiliency shown by my community of North Vancouver over the past year. And I'm not solely talking about COVID-19. Earlier this year, a man stormed through the Lynn Valley community on a rampage, stabbing seven people. It is an act of violence that has left our community reeling, but it is the heroism and the community spirit that I want to speak about today. Because while the violence was occurring, people scrambled to help one another, pulling each other into safety and performing first aid until emergency responders arrived. Sheila Clausen was one of those community heroes. She's a longtime biology teacher at Argyle Secondary School, and Shayla ran towards the scene and went to the aid of a woman who was being attacked by the man and beat him off with her umbrella. The attacker then stabbed Shayla in the back of the head. Fortunately, she and five other victims survived. However, sadly, the seventh victim passed away from their injuries. 
What followed this nightmarish scene, however, was an outpouring of support and community spirit that has become familiar for our beautiful North Vancouver community. An enormous public memorial of flowers and well wishes filled the street. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were raised to support the victims and their families. All of this is a testament to the strength and power of our community and certainly of love. North Vancouver has had a, a very difficult year. The first death to COVID-19 in all of Canada happened at a long-term care facility in North Vancouver on March 8, 2020. And what followed were grueling months for their residents, their families, and the staff at the Lynn Valley Care Centre. I personally remember the weekend following the announcement of the coronavirus outbreak there very clearly. Panicked community members and family members have called me about a horrible situation at the care center where almost no staff had shown up to care for the elderly, leaving families to fill in the gaps at the dangerously understaffed facility. I was on the phone, of course, to the Minister of Health right away, who had already heard about what was happening and was thankfully working very rapidly to correct the situation. It was still early on in British Columbia's experience with coronavirus and the fear was palpable. And it was this fear that a man who was later arrested and charged took advantage of when he made a hoax phone call to the Lynn Valley Care Center that directly resulted in the staff shortage that weekend. It was a very serious and very dangerous hoax that I could not believe somebody would do. I couldn't believe that anyone would do such a thing. I can't imagine what his motivation was. It was a grim and deeply concerning start to what would follow to become a year long pandemic for British Columbians with the days still counting forward. Fires did its damage and spread through care homes throughout the region and beyond. And people were asked to stay in their homes as much as possible to stay safe. And I remember how critical Dr. Bonnie Henry's words became, be kind, be calm, be safe. A critically important motto for British Columbians. And for the most part, British Columbians did follow that motto, giving up social visits, closing down businesses, giving up wages, staying home, all in the name of keeping their community safe, not just for themselves, but also for those that they didn't know. But not everyone could stay home because all across British Columbia, critical workers continued their daily journeys to their jobs in grocery stores and bike shops, into hospitals and care homes, to their jobs driving ferries, buses, taxis, sea buses, and trucks. They cared for our children, our elderly, our vulnerable. They kept our homes powered. They kept us fed. They kept us safe. And so we all learned who the truly essential workers of our societies were. And they weren't the wealthy stock traders, the high-priced corporate lawyers or Lamborghini driving executives in expensive suits. They were regular people doing regular, underappreciated frontline jobs, many of whom were paid some of the lowest wages in our province, which is why it was so important for our government to continue to raise the minimum wage. And now it is set to be $15.00. 20 cents per hour effective June 1st. All of this, all of our success here in British Columbia could not have been possible without the work of British Columbians, both those who stayed home and certainly to all of the essential workers, who I say thank you to from the bottom of my heart. So as you can tell, of course, it has been a difficult time. There's not a single person who doesn't have a story of how the pandemic has impacted them in some way. 
It's had a significant impact on our mental, emotional, and physical health. And it's here that I really want to acknowledge the strength and unity of British Columbians as a whole. But what I admire most is our resiliency during these challenging times and how we as British Columbians have come together to support our communities, our neighbors, our families, and even strangers. We aren't quite all the way through the storm yet. We still have a ways to go. But with vaccine distribution now underway, there is better weather ahead. And that's why our government's top priority is protecting people's health and livelihoods as we accelerate British Columbia's vaccine rollout. With over a million people in BC already having received their first vaccine dose and thousands more getting it every single day, I feel a cautious hope and, and optimism that we'll soon be able to come together physically once more. Now with our government's new mandate, now well underway, I find myself with added duties on top of my responsibilities to my community as their MLA. And it is an honor to serve on the Premier's Executive Council as his Minister of State for Infrastructure, and an absolute pleasure to work with the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure in delivering the transportation projects and services that people need and rely on. Over the past several months, the Minister and I have worked closely to develop a plan for the future, while also delivering what people need today. And I'm proud to see this reflected in our government's strong speech. COVID-19 has changed a lot about the way that we live our lives and certainly about the way that we travel. Transit ridership is down around the world. And while we are seeing promising returns of ridership in Metro Vancouver, many other places are unsure of whether their ridership numbers will ever recover. We have to recognize that people are now working from home and video conferencing meetings have become a mainstay in our households seemingly overnight and commuting, telecommuting, I suspect, is likely here to stay. But it, there's still a question as to what extent it will permanently replace physical commutes. It's still hard to say right now. But there are some things that we know will likely not change. We know that people will continue to want safe, integrated, and efficient and affordable ways to get around to where they need to go. And that means that as a government, we must continue to strive for forward-thinking transportation systems and networks that meet the needs of those people. When the pandemic is over, there's very little doubt that climate change will still be an issue that we must pull together to resolve for the sake of our children's futures. And that means we must continue to reach for low carbon footprints in whatever transportation systems we enable. And transportation systems will still need to be designed with awareness of the inequality that exists in our communities and an intention to enable greater socioeconomic justice. And all of this means that the commitments our government made prior to COVID-19 to invest in public transit, to invest in affordable housing, to working with local governments in order to create livable communities and increase active transportation and enable micromobility, all of this will continue to be incredibly important as we move forward through and out of this pandemic. Our government's continued commitment to prioritize public transit funding will still be critical historic investment. We're making a historic capital investment. That means more buses and more rapid transit, but more bus rapid transit as well, more sea bus service, and new rail rapid transit lines, all of this representing the largest investment in transit in BC's history. And as mentioned earlier, transit ridership numbers are still a long way from pre-COVID levels, but we've been working closely with TransLink and BC Transit to ensure that they can provide, continue to provide their essential services because we know how important a strong transit service will be to our success on multiple levels as we begin to restore the economy through BC's Restart Plan. Our government intends to continue to support transit in BC and further invest in it by expanding its infrastructure. Work broke ground, for instance, this spring on the Broadway subway line a project that will expand mass transit capabilities along what has been, prior to COVID-19 at least, the busiest bus route in Canada and the US. Demolition is currently 
underway along the station locations to make room for new stations. And we really look forward to bringing the new service online in 2025. Our government has also heard from local governments and the community around the need for transit option between Surrey and Langley. More growth in Surrey and Langley regions means more commuters and travelers who need efficient and reliable transportation options to get around the region. So we're going to be working hard to deliver the Surrey Langley SkyTrain to meet the needs of that growing region. But public transit isn't the only mode of transportation we need to pursue in our path towards a cleaner transportation system. We need to give people more environmentally, socially responsible choices in how they can move around and live their lives. And that's why I was really proud to support the former Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Claire Trebena, in her release of Move, Commute, Connect, which is BC's active transportation strategy. Move, Commute, Connect will continue to be our government strategy to double the trips taken by active transportation by 2030. And it's part of Clean BC that will help, that will continue to be our climate action strategy. And this commits us to reducing overall GHG emissions in our province by 40% by 2030, 60% by 2040, and 80% by 2050. Now, like I mentioned earlier, a lot has changed about the way that British Columbians travel, but we've also seen how communities can fill the void that was left by rapid declines in public transit usage during the first couple of months of COVID-19 with more active transportation. We've seen communities open up car-free roads to encourage walking and cycling, and I feel like I've never seen more casual bike riding in the communities around me than there have been during COVID-19. In some cities, road space has been repurposed for people rather than as parking, as communities work to expand patios and other services out into the roads that were previously reserved only for what are effectively large steel cages on four wheels. I'm reminded of a 2019 study, actually. It was titled, The Social Cost of Automobility, Cycling, and Walking in the European Union. And it calculated that every kilometer driven by a car incurred an external cost of about 17 Canadian cents, whereas cycling and walking brought in benefits of about 28 and 58 cents, Canadian cents per kilometer. And so while there's still very important reasons to invest in roads and highway infrastructure in many parts of British Columbia, there are also opportunities, particularly in more densely populated areas, to choose how we encourage travel behavior to rebound after the pandemic. The world is different now, and we don't know for sure what lies ahead, but the need for a continued focus on cleaner, healthier transportation choices that enable livable, sustainable communities absolutely remains. And we know that the need for reliable road infrastructure and highway networks throughout British Columbia will continue to be critical as British Columbia rebuilds its economy and retools for the future. Highway networks connect people to services, goods to market, and communities to communities, while bridges and tunnels help British Columbians navigate the challenging natural landscapes of our province. So it's important that we maintain and replace critical infrastructure throughout our problems, not only to maintain and improve connectivity, but also as part of our work to create good family supporting jobs and invest in our communities. Mm -hmm. So projects like the Patello Bridge replacement project creates jobs for BC workers and supports economic growth by providing new reliable infrastructure in this case, a new and reliable bridge that replaces an aging piece of infrastructure. For years, we've heard from community members and stakeholders about the safety concerns and traffic issues that they experienced on the bridge. The narrow lanes made it difficult for people to move around safely, and at night, lane closures meant longer delays. So our government's been listening to these concerns and has been engaging consistently with key stakeholders, including local governments and First Nations. And I'm pleased to say that In River Works began on the project earlier this year and that we're proud of the project and the work that we've done with our partners in the community. The new bridge will also create safe and accessible infrastructure for people who travel by bike, on foot, or use other mobility devices through the development of a multi-use path and connections. Replacement of the George Massey Crossing is another important priority for our government. 
collaboration and community are critically important. And that, that's why our government has taken the approach that we have on the George Massey Crossing project. The George Massey is a vital crossing for people in Delta and Ladner traveling into Richmond, Vancouver, and the rest of the region. And it's also a critical path, uh, pardon me, a critical part of, the, of Highway 99, which is an important trade corridor that becomes the I-5 as it crosses into our southern border. It's the only road in the USA's interstate highway system to run all the way from Canada down to Mexico. And the Highway 99 and the George Massey Crossing is an important part of that. So our government received the business case for options to replace this crossing late last year. And I look forward to providing an update on the way forward on this project soon. Over towards the east, we know that the Fraser Valley is also growing at a very rapid pace. And our government has heard from people that they're frustrated and tired of spending time away from their families as they travel along, along Highway 1. Highway 1, as many of you know, is not only a major connection between communities in the region, but a key corridor in the transport, transport of goods and services within our province. Approximately $27 billion of goods travels along the Trans-Canada Highway to the Alberta border alone every year. The Premier has made it clear that the concerns of the people who live in the Fraser Valley are his concerns and that our government will make the Fraser Valley a priority for us in the way that previous BC Liberal governments did not. And that's why capacity improvements along Highway 1 are proceeding with haste to a reliable, to create a reliable, efficient corridor to support the movement of people, goods and services. Additional HOV lanes have already been extended along Highway 1 from 202nd Street to 216th Street, and construction is set to begin this summer for the 10-kilometer stretch between 216th and 264th. Plans are simultaneously proceeding for work out to Whatcom Road. But in addition to our work on transportation, the throne speech highlighted concrete actions that will be taking over the next, over the next year and over the next several years, to ensure that BC comes out of the pandemic stronger and more resilient. And we're gonna be doing this by doing what we've always done, which is by focusing on people. We'll be improving healthcare, so BC is better prepared for future challenges. We wanna address cracks in the long-term care that COVID-19 has exposed. And certainly I've spoken about some of those and thank goodness we've already addressed many of them already, but there's more to do. We also are working, continuing to work on reducing surgery wait times, building more hospitals and urgent primary care centers in every part of British Columbia. We're also continuing to work on our promise to work towards affordability. We've eliminated MSP premiums so far, which has saved families up to $1,800 per year and introduced the BC Child Opportunity Benefit, which provides families with eight children under 18 years old up to $1,600 per child per year. We'll continue our work to making life more affordable through changes to ICBC that will cut car insurance rates by 20%, but we're also expanding access to $10 a day childcare spaces. Childcare investments are incredibly important to my community, where we have many young families trying to not only make ends meet, but trying to get ahead. It's also particularly important in the community of North Vancouver Lonsdale, um, where many of, my, many of the families that I serve uh, are led by single parents. Nearly one in five families with children in the city of North Vancouver are led by single parents. And so access to childcare is extremely important. Access to affordable housing is also exceptionally important. Uh, not only for those families and individuals who are of lower income and experiencing poverty, but also for many individuals and families who are middle income, who require rental homes or housing options within that missing middle that we talk about. So our government is going to be continuing our work, building out social housing, supportive housing, but also below market affordable housing for families of middle income uh, with middle, 
middle level incomes. I was really pleased to see the Attorney General, Minister of Housing, announce recently uh, the added investment of $2 billion into our Housing Hub program, which is specifically designed to support the development of middle income housing. On top of, of course, the support of housing and the social housing that our government is already funding uh, and supporting all throughout the province, including right here in North Vancouver. We're supporting businesses with grants to help them build or expand online stores. And we've introduced legislation to support the operations of NBC Strategic Investment Fund. Pardon me, I should say that again. It's called NBC. INBC, all one word is it's a strategic investment fund that will help promising BC firms scale up and keep more jobs here in British Columbia. We're also going to be building more inclusive communities by developing BC's first anti racism law. And I am so grateful for the appointment of Parliamentary Secretary, um, oh, I can't say her name, but the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti Racism. The work that she has been doing so far her understanding of the issue, her passion for fighting racism, brings me great hope that we're going to be able to take some very serious steps towards a much more inclusive future here in British Columbia. We're also going to be introducing landmark legislation to remove barriers to accessibility and barriers to inclusion that are experienced by British Columbians with disabilities. And we'll continue to do our work to better protect the environment, of course, with sectoral targets for GHG reductions. For transportation, our sectoral targets for 2030 are to reduce our GHG emissions by nearly one third. And transportation accounts for about 41% of the GHGs that British Columbia is responsible for. So this is an extremely, it's a large, but also extremely important task. And we're gonna be doing that work Finally, I, I see that I'm running short on time here, so maybe I'll, I'll end with my concluding remarks, which is how one usually ends very long speeches like this. I want to say that community has really played a significant role in our lives over the past year. Even as we've stayed apart, what I found is we found ways to really strengthen the feelings of community within people. And as we looked for ways to support one another, to lift each other up and to keep ourselves safe. It's community that's brought us together when we were physically apart. And it's community that has helped us weather the COVID storm. So I'm really honored to speak here today in support of our government's throne speech to highlight the ways that we are looking out for our communities and the people within them. And I look forward to working with every member of this house, every member of this house to ensure that we as a province are able to come out of this pandemic strong, healthy, and resilient. Thank you so much, Honorable Speaker.